What's up, Milkman? Uh, can you hear me? Give me, give me thumbs up on audio or thumbs down, whatever, whatever you want to do. Going on here. No sound. Oh, cool. I'm gonna call that a call that a win. Awesome. Hey, Bruce, Phil, Dennis, Audrey, Miguel, Rob, Jake. What's going on, guys? All right. So you see, I'm standing in front of a monitor here, and it's all whitewashed. My lights are bad. Whenever I go to change these bulbs. I say they're bad. They're perfectly fine. They light the garage up awesome. Got a real white light, but uh, I'm gonna have to change to more of a yellow natural sunlight look to um, complement video production. Back to work already, huh? No, not really. <laughs> uh, this is my garage. So <laughs> um, we're just in one corner of my garage, Some a whole bunch of 300ZX parts. Um, my toolboxes are, are in the garage. They're they're over here. Made it. Maco box and my Maco cart and my side cabinet and got one of my my diag cart is here. This is the one that's got the yeah. Uh, you can't see in the right off camera, but the BNC connections at the front for the Pico. Hey Richard. So um, it's live stream update and stuff because there's like actually a lot of stuff. Uh, some of you guys saw in the last video. I got fired, um, so I don't work anywhere right now. I am. Rolling self-employed and seeing how that works, sink or swim, we're going to see how that goes. Uh, not the best so far, but hey, it's better than nothing. Um, so what else is going on? Oh, I want to thank everyone. Hey, Josh. I want to thank everyone because the channel has surpassed 3,000 subscribers, which is freaking amazing, by the way. Uh, hey, V8. Uh, hey, Gasson. What's going on? Uh, work on a garage cash only. No, I'm a legit business. I, you know, file everything with the state. Um, it's a legitimate LLC. You can do a business entity search if you'd like. My company, L1 Automotive Diagnostics and Programming. Um, been a business entity for a while. I had, I had to start one at some point when it came to doing some training stuff. Because I was like, oh, I'm going to accept checks from businesses and stuff. I'm going to have to be able to open a bank account. Greetings from Portugal. Wow, that's awesome. It should be a good one. Yeah, eight powers there. This is a good one because we're in front of a monitor. If I turned it off, uh, if you if you're able to see the beginning of the live stream, uh, you would have saw what's up there. So on uh, on my Patreon channel, I've been so I've been writing this eight hour J twenty five thirty four module programming class. Uh, this is a one hundred percent my own material versus some other stuff I had done for people. Just presented other companies class. One particular company's class. Um, so this particular one is one that I've been writing. It's all my own material, all my own case studies, everything 100% ground up is mine. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed if any of the, I don't think any of the train by text guys are in yet. I didn't even tell them. Uh, we're getting these shirts made, these, these, uh, multicolor coach style shirts and, uh, my fat booty squeezed into one that they got me a little tight. Uh, no, I'm wearing an undershirt because it's cold as balls. Um. Anyways, we got these. These are nice embroidered. They have the Train by Text logo, and then they, they have a little red member. Uh, <laughs> it says member, and it's written in red. Anyways, uh, so on my Patreon channel, I did the uh, a first introduction part of this, trying to work out all the how am I going to do this. I tell you now, trying to live stream the PowerPoint using my OBS Studio software blows. It is not, not good. I'm crapping my way over here. I know I look weird. I was trying to see something past. I got like a laptop, another monitor, a computer on a cart, and then this cart and this monitor, separate computer. There are literally three computers going to do this. So, um, on my Patreon channel, I did the first part of that class. So I'm going to do a little bit more of it here, and then we're going to kick back over to back on the Patreon channel for for. Um, Sorry, I'm watching myself and it's weird. I look like an idiot. 
uh, and the camera does add 71 pounds. Hidden. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to do some of the class here just as my Sunday live stream after I update you guys, and then I'm going to go ahead because that's a teaser and everyone hates that and I don't really care. Uh, I'm going to do the rest of the next part two of the class over on the live Patreon channel. You guys will see that. Um, so, I already did the first part, and where we left off on the first part um, was why do we need R to R? So you guys missed the first part one. There'll probably be like nine parts to do this. Um, so the first part of it was uh, completed. We're at, now we're at the point where we say, why do we need R to R? Why do we need right to repair? You guys missed the terminology slide. You guys missed a bunch of the slides. So you're just going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to enjoy the little piece of it that you get or hate it, whatever. Um, but to try to draw some attraction to the class a little bit, um, I am going to give a piece of it out here for free for you guys. I hope you enjoy what little piece of it. It is still in the boring section of the, of the PowerPoint of the class. Uh, I'm not a death by PowerPoint guy. I'm not a let's talk for two and a half hours about uh, J2534 and what it is. Hey, SKO. Uh, I'm not that guy. I don't really like being in classes and listening to two and a half hours of why a law exists. I don't really care. I was studying criminal justice. Level one. Hey, man. Hey, Fazio. Back to work. <laughs> it's Sunday. Deal with it. So, um, anyways, I don't like dealing with all that. So this class has approximately 35 minutes tops. I think I timed myself the first time I ran through it. And it is an ever-evolving class. Until it's done, it's not done. And even when it's done, it's not done. Sunday. Uh, DeFazio does. DeFazio works uh, 26 hours a day, nine days a week. Cool, does. Um, so whatever you guys see here is not what... As a matter of fact, what's funny is, is this slide is in 4-3 four, uh, four, aspect ratio. The actual class is in 16-9 with a whole different background. This is just an old set of slides I had. I have some of the info in here. Um, so just to show you guys that what you see here isn't the full in class. So basically, if you like what's here, you'll really like what's in the actual class when I get to doing it. So, we're going to get going. Like I said, thank you guys. It's amazing. The uh, channel is at 3,000 subscribers. Um, and what else can I say? What else can I say? Oh, yeah. For you guys didn't see it, I got fired. I don't work at a shop anymore. Um, and for the ones that were asking why I got fired, uh, I was told we're going... In a different direction and then uh that i should take the day to go find another job the following day i went back to get a few of my things um and just there was already another toolbox there so another direction meant they found somebody else uh probably a lot cheaper than me to be honest um and he's probably cool with flagging like 50 hours and because i'm not anyways moving on Grab my tech shirts. These are what everyone's going to have. And uh, we're going to get rolling on this. So, I started a lot. This is where I ended the last class. Why do we need right to repair? And it was really simple. It's to fix cars. And that was, that was almost all the slides for right to repair. Uh, was all the equipment yours? Yes, all the equipment that you had seen me using, with the exception of the AE Tools laptop, was mine. And I have my own laptop that has pretty much the same stuff the AE Tools one does. So all the equipment you saw me using for the most part was 100% mine. All the scopes, scan tools, uh, all that stuff, with the exception of the Ytech 2.0. I don't have a Ytech 2.0 for myself. So I lost a little bit of functionality there, but that's okay. So anyways, your channel will only get bigger. Good. Thanks, James. All right, so I'm trying to get too terribly distracted, but I do have your guys' chat up, and I want to interact with you because that's the whole point. Uh, and plus, we only have 20 minutes left before I have to go do, uh, don't have to, before I get the pleasure of going and doing a whole bunch more of this class for my Patreon guys. And I'm going to keep saying that, and you guys go, oh, because he just wants money. Uh, I don't have a job, and yes. <laughs> no, anyways, guys, for real, I wanted to offer some kind of value for the guys that were donating to the channel to help the channel. So... That value is, if you guys get this class that I normally would teach for 
Depends how I would teach it. I've never done an eight hour lecture instruction class, so I have no idea how I would bill for this. But regardless, uh, I wanted to supply you guys some value and I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been on the channel. So hopefully you get to see some of the uh, class and really like it. So, like I said, why do we need R2R to fix cars? Well, the biggest part of fixing cars today is the access to information, uh, using your own noggin, uh, your critical thinking skills, and uh, another big portion of it is, to be honest, there has started to be a much larger gap between what an aftermarket scan tool will do and what you need in comparison to the OE scan tool. OE scan tools are getting better and better, and for a long, long time, you could really get by with the top of the line modus or with a good OTC tool. And for most issues, even though some diagnostic processes can be much faster with the OE tool. Even today, we can still solve 99% of problems with an aftermarket scan tool. Um, but then we get to doing the actual repair side and we start replacing parts and there are relearns, there are recalibrations, there are basic settings, there are things that need to be done that a bunch of aftermarket scan tools just do not cover. So it's getting more and more and more that you're going to need an OE scan tool, an OE level scan tool. And that was the right to repair. Uh, you guys missed the slide. Hi, Andres. You guys missed the slide about uh, the legal requirements of right to repair and what it gave us. Um, so, moving on. Uh, beyond fixing cars, that's the real need for right to repair, and it was our right as independents to repair these vehicles. Um, so, let's talk about what RDR opens up, and moving on on the J2534 part, part of this class. This class is titled J2534 Module Reprogramming uh, Domestic and Asian. So the next big part in this class we're talking about, uh, again, you guys missed the outline, so bear with me, is equipment. So, and when I mean equipment, I don't mean just hardware, because we're talking about, this is a takeaway from Nastif. Uh, it's, just, it's a screenshot of Nastif, but this is just information. This is a conglomeration of information done by the National Automotive Service Task Force. Uh, it's not the end all tell all, it's not the end all be all of everything. It's there's just a conglomeration of a lot of good information. So a lot of the information I pull for this class is available for free at NASTF's website, um, NASTF.org. Now, the other stuff on here, you're gonna see there's an aftermarket scan tool, there's a programming power supply, there's a Bosch J box, some keys, and you're gonna see a laptop here. Um, there's a lot more going on than just this. This isn't the only equipment we need, and within each of these there are a, a ton of requirements. So let's just kind of break down our equipment list. We're gonna start with the Windows-based PC. Uh, you Mac guys, sorry. They just, not everything's compatible with Mac. You, you've always had that issue with compatibility. Uh, all the OEs are currently on Windows. We'll see in the future that may change. Probably be going to Android, to be honest. Um, I'm sure iOS will have its its ability to do that. The next thing is a voltage stable power supply. Uh, now this is important. Your conventional battery chargers you use in the shop, uh, you select an amperage rating, you know, the current, the work being done, you're selecting 20, 40, 10, 2 amps. And then if you've ever put a voltmeter on a battery while you're charging at one of those amperages, in order to maintain that amperage output, it's going to fluctuate the voltage up and down. Uh, now when we're flashing modules, voltage needs to be stable because everything we're doing is riding on this voltage line. Uh, we're sending information and that information is very specific packets of information pressed over these data lines which are just changes up and down of voltage. So voltage is important. It fluctuating can make it appear to be a different message than what it's intending to send out. So just to put it to put it a lot more simply, we need to be we need the voltage to be stable, and each manufacturer has a certain voltage range that it specifies. And the closer we can get to being a very clean, stable, and when I say clean, we're going to get into that later, clean, stable power supply is really important. So that's next on our list. After that, we need a J2534 device, and I even wrote maybe two. Um, you're going to find that I will use the words validation of equipment. And what I mean by that is an OE manufacturer may have validated a certain device. And that device has been tested by them and proven to work under the condition it needs to work and properly. And when a device is validated to a manufacturer, that manufacturer will supply some kind of technical support in the event that you have a problem. So for instance, let's say we're doing a 
General Motors module flash and we run into an error code that we're not familiar with and we don't have any experience with. Uh, GM offers a technical helpline for J2534 module programming. Well, if we dial up that helpline and we talk to that individual, the first thing they're gonna ask us is, what computer are we using? We're gonna get into if our computer meets that and what's important about that. And then they're gonna ask what device we're using. What VCI, what pass-through device, what JBox, all that. Again, terminology, you guys missed the slide, sorry. Um, the, if SPS or if, if AC Delco has determined that one device is validated and you say you're using another device, their immediate default is, look, we have not tested that device to even work at all with our system. Yes, that device claims to meet all J2534-1 or 2 standards, whatever you're using, again, back in some other slides. Um, and we've tested X device to work. You're using a device that has not been proven to be validated by us. So they're going to default to, it's the, it's the hardware's fault, call the hardware manufacturer. Well, if you call the, hard, if you call the hardware manufacturer, they're going to say, look, it meets J2534, sorry that... We didn't pay AC Delco or GM to validate that device, but the device works properly. We've done a thousand successful flashes. You're stuck in limbo, you gotta figure it out yourself. So that's the, the cause for needing maybe more than one JBox or J2534 device is um, not every manufacturer validates. I don't think there's one device that's validated by all manufacturers. So you're gonna be covered really well with two different devices. So, and I'm gonna get into more of that later. Hey, Joel. And uh, the two I specifically recommend usually are a Kardec device by, by Drew Tech and then the Bosch device. I personally use the Bosch uh, first generation Master Tech VCI. Um, they have a new version out and there's a picture of that at the, beginning of the, at the beginning of the screen and you'll see what that looks like. But they have a lot of new stuff coming out. And if you haven't purchased anything yet, I would wait because there's a lot changing and this class is gonna evolve as the right to repair unrolls and we start seeing more and more of these things we're talking about um we're talking about dual protocols over internet protocol we're talking about all kinds of different changes that are going on uh mega can with chrysler there, there are a lot of things that are changing so maybe you'd want to hold off maybe you don't maybe you need to get into it today that's that's a decision you're going to have to make so the next part of our equipment that we need is going to be the oe programming software now oe programming software there are other aftermarket softwares out there for programming. You guys have heard of HP tuners and such for doing aftermarket tuning. Um, that's, that's a different story. That's, there are pieces of that in this class, but uh, is the Autel and the Launch, so 8 Power Zero asks, is the Autel and the Launch the best aftermarket scan tools for this work for now? Um, Launch and Autel both sell J2534 devices. Uh, with their tools, Chris says, "Wait, start over." Not happening. Uh, <laughs> they both offer, so they are the they are the two recommended aftermarket tools by me and a lot of other people for meeting a part of this. And we're actually going to get to those tools in this slide here momentarily. So just hang on, Eight Power at zero. What's your? I've already asked you once before. I'm sorry, Eight Power. What was your first name? Anyways, but is it compatible with every module? Right. That's in here too, Andres. Uh, so this OEM programming software is gonna be whatever software that the, the manufacturer has supplied to comply with the J2534 law um, or standard. I'm, I'm gonna use the word law and standard a lot. Again, that's back in the terminology slide. Uh, don't confuse those, they're not the same thing. Anyways, OEM programming software will be, for instance, Nissan has NERS. It's a Nissan ECU reprogramming software. That is a separate software from their diagnostic software called Consult. Um, that software is completely different. It was designed to comply with the J2534 standard because um, Nissan and Chrysler alike, um, their factory VCI, their, their device that's used to connect the computer to the car, that was part of the programming process. So the software file, that you, the calibration file, would be loaded onto the device through the computer the device would check that, that calibration file, confirm that it's correct, then the device would actually carry out, the VCI would actually carry out the process of erasing the calibration that's on the module you're trying to reprogram or program, uh, and then the device would push the new file onto that. Now, J2534 is designed as a pass-through. That's the terminology that's used even in the protocol. 
which means that it doesn't stop at the device. It directly passes through the vehicle communication interface to the car's network, over the network, to the module. So because it's completely different than the original programming within the original diagnostic flashing software from the manufacturer, um, it's separate. So if you have the factory VCI, you could use Consult and do the module flash. Consult doesn't work with a passive device, old Consult 3 Plus. They have a right to repair version that does for certain restricted models, and we got into that earlier. Um, awesome, Nolan, thank you. So, this OEM programming software is sometimes the same as the factory software, and sometimes it is specifically designed for a J2534 device. Uh, Chrysler and Nissan are big examples because they both, like I said, use the original vehicle communication interface as a port and a, and a part of the network and process. Uh, because a JBox doesn't do that, uh, they had to reproduce, they had to manufacture and reprogram all of their factory, uh, a, a new software to do this. And because of that, Nissan and Chrysler are the most, some of the most problematic aftermarket JBox flashes that happen. The, the process with Nissan and Chrysler are probably account for 70 to 80 percent of any kind of failures, hiccups, or problems in the aftermarket J2534 area that I've, that I've ran into. Uh, primarily Nissan just because the, the process itself is confusing and not very clear. And a lot of manual steps are required for that, much like Chrysler. And again, it's because the original software was designed completely separate. Do I think that OBD connectors will be advanced, advancing in the near future? Um, the answer is too late. We've already done that. There are some, there are some, um, Ford is similar, Chris, uh, very similar. And I get into that later on in the Ford section. Uh, I just use Nissan and Chrysler because they are the worst of, the, of that world. Um, OB connectors are advancing in the near future because that future is already here. If you've worked on some newer General Motors, uh, full plug-in hybrids or hybrids, uh, you'll notice there's a separate um, like J1962 style connector, but it doesn't meet the J1962 standard because if you look at the pins, uh, there's not even a B plus pin in the right spot and there's no six and 14 pins. So if you plug your scan tool into that, you get nothing. And it's over on the passenger side. Then on the driver's side, there's another one. So we're already reaching the limits of that. I think you can only uh, have is it like six separate networks on one two wire can before you just start having so many problems? Does this apply to 06 plus Nissan Titans because they've been around longer than the second gen? Therefore, there should be more support, right? Right. Nissan flashes as the years progress, they have gotten higher and higher in success rate, uh, but there's still lots of problems because the original base software for doing diagnostics and module flashing was built with the VCI as part of that process. So basically all Nissan's 2018 and down were like that. Right to Repairs changed that. Maserati fits into that same kind of problem, and Chris, you know why. Quit trolling. <laughs> Anyways, so that's the part of the OEM programming software that's required. That's the software from the, from the OE. Sometimes it's the same. Um, Toyota Textream, they called it Textream Lite. It was essentially the same thing. The factory Toyota Textream software is compatible with almost all J2534 devices. Almost fully. There are definitely some restrictions and always caveats in there. Never can I say um, that all XYZ or everything or never, those are words that I may use. I don't mean them. There are always exceptions. See, I see, see how I use the word always there. Um, so getting past OEM programming software, we know that. Next big part, service information. Service information is important because without it, uh, we're kind of lost. There are specific things that need to be done in certain orders when you do these, and Ford's a good example. Uh, I get asked a lot that they, they can't get this, these keys to program on this Ford, they just replace this module. Um, and a big part of it is, is they didn't erase the secret key to reinitialize the, the communication between the BCM and the new PCM because one's named Dave and one's named Carl, and Dave the BCM has always been talking to Steve, the old PCM, and now Carl's there, and he has no idea who Carl is, and he's not talking to him. That's my analogy for it. So somebody, uh, Keith's got to come in and tell, hey, look, Dave, Carl, you guys are best friends. You're good to go. Listen to each other. Whatever Dave says is right. You know, just listen. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things that gets skipped. That's just little things. Without that service information, you wouldn't know. With Fords, get done with a module replacement on a late model Ford, and all your interior lights are flashing, and you have no idea why. 
Well, did you read the service information? Because you're supposed to relearn all the TPMS sensors. Uh, well, this truck's got aftermarket wheels and there's no TPMS sensors on it and the customer doesn't care, but he does care about the interior light, so how do I fix that? Now you're in a predicament. You need to read <laughs> someone buy Carl beer, correct. You're gonna have to read the service information before you do this flash. If you read it afterwards, now you're stuck with a Ford with flashing interior lights and what do you do? And there are ways around that and we're gonna get to that. Um, and, and before somebody jumps on the chat and answers, yeah, you should probably carry a couple TPMS sensors, four to be exact, for a Ford um, in your truck if you're doing this. Or read the service information ahead of time and prepare the shop that if this truck has aftermarket wheels and no TPMS sensors, when we get done doing this flash, the job isn't complete. We may have to do keys, and that's a big part of why the keys run the equipment. The biggest thing we run into is keys. Again, Ford's a good example of that. So make sure you read your service information. Even if you've done a year or two different of this, it may not, you're like, oh, it's pretty much the same truck. One year, one month, one day can make or break the difference between you having everything you need to do the job and not. Hey, Tommy. So this is where we get to what you're asking about with the, um, Andreas, this is, I think you were the one that brought this up about scan tool. So the next part is having a compatible scan tool or a capable scan tool. Compatible is one thing, capable is another. So will this scan tool do everything we need to do when we get done? So we just put a brand new PCM in a Nissan. Um, we'll say it's a 2010 Altima. Uh, we just put this thing in. Tommy, that, uh, that got blocked out. Let me, there we go. Sorry. Tommy, when you use profanity, it takes your comment off there. There's some in that fridge on the bottom by the squirrel blind. <laughs> That's right, Bert. Uh, we're out now, actually. No more beer. I needed that on Monday when I got fired. Um, so, the uh, capable scan tool. We've got a 2010 Nissan Altima. We just put a new PCM in it. The old one died. It wouldn't talk. Um, we get done. We do the module flash. Why won't this thing start? Well, in 2010 with NAS 5.0, we got to use... We got we got to do some keys. We got to tell we got to tell this PCM the keys that were on it before are the good ones. So uh, Tommy says tried to PMI a BCM with the RO tool, corrupted the BCM for some reason, thought it was dually. Yeah, that happens. You got to have a capable scan tool. You got to be able to do the process. So again, uh, with this capable scan tool, we've got to do keys. So your tool has to be able to do keys. Uh, did you read your service information? Are you familiar with the process of doing keys? Because you got to have a PIN code. So do you have your LSID? We talked about that at the beginning. Do you have everything you need to do this job? You've got to read the service information. You've got to have the tools to do the job. It's not, it's not as easy as, oh, I bought the subscription and I got a J-Box. I think I can do everything now. Uh, you, you need to read first. And that's with the capable scan tool, with the key function, the immobilizer PIN, like I said. Chrysler, Nissan, all that stuff. You're gonna have to, this all goes back to the service information, being prepared to do the job. So can you guys, I'm gonna give you guys a second to think what else would we need to do this kind of this kind of work? Are there any other things? I talked about TPMS sensors, having keys. Forge, you gotta have two keys. If you only have one key, you might be stuck. There's a way around that. I did a video on it. I'll talk about it in this class. Uh, what are some other things? So keys, a mobilizer pin, service information, capable scan tool. Um, what else could we need? Can anyone think of anything I didn't cover? Is there anything out there that uh, you've ran into? That's a, big, that's a big part of it. And this is where I would stop and have some conversation. Somebody would bring something up usually that I'd never even heard of before because they were doing some module flash on some something weird. And, and you know, we'd run into information where we go, hmm, I didn't know that, and that's where we would all learn something. Um, so the next slide, we were gonna be talking about the specifics of the PC. Uh, and this is perfect, because it took me just about the right time to get here. So, capable scan tools used the dealership are the only ones capable of reprogramming remote start after losing the fob. Wish we could reprogram that ourselves. Uh, there's stuff around that. Um, yeah, that the subscription part, perfect, Bert. Uh, that's important because the OE programming software requires a subscription to use. How to keep the ignition on on keyless vehicles. Right, that process is important. Sometimes there are specific things you need to do like uh, turning on hazard flashers and you gotta worry about, well, is the voltage fluctuating too much? Uh, subscriptions to everything, that's right. 
the battery maintained. That's the voltage stable power supply. That's there are 150 things you're going to need, and you've got to read that service information, and you've got to read it from the service information provider. Because I don't know if you guys ever tried to do an alternator on a uh, like a 2003 Ford Focus, and you read the service information through all data. It's got all the service information straight out of Ford's Oasis, except it's missing four pages where it says you have to loosen the motor mount and move the engine forward because it's not on all models, just a few. So the one they did it on, they were like, oh, that's not needed, leave that out. Trust me, I ran into one. Right, Chris, no antivirus. We've got to set up our computer properly. And here's a little sneak peek. Next screen, I talk about the Windows-based PC. OTC 700Q, 700A, that's, that's right, Keith. We gotta have a proper voltage power supply. So we're, go we're gonna talk about specifics of equipment, my recommendations, what I've found, other equipment. Don't let your laptop go to sleep. That all goes into the next thing. That all comes in the next slide about we're gonna talk about the PC. But we're not because I gotta go. It's 431, I'm already late. Um, so guys, I appreciate you hanging out. I gotta head over to Patreon now and do the video for those guys. And we're gonna continue on this class. Uh, so this is the section uh, this is part 2.1, part or 2.0, and 2.1 will be next. That's on the other end. So we're going to finish up this this next series of it, or this next part of the class. Um, so I appreciate you guys hanging out. Again, thanks everyone for getting the 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 uh, channel to 3,000 subscribers. That's huge. I could never imagine that when when I started doing this. Um, I want you guys to remember that. I'm going to try to do as much as I can. You saw I put the video out on like Cobalt. I'm, try, I'm not really doing a whole lot of video on that right now because I, I just got to start making money to support my family. So it's a lot of our money out of our pocket to die. I can fix these customers' cars that they don't understand. That's right. So OTC 700, thanks. Yeah, Chad, that's a good, that's a good one. Chris Martino, Troll Level 100. Mario. Mario, um... I know you missed it. Uh, for all the guys that missed the first class, I know I said that I was going to get it edited and stuff. I actually finished editing it like 20 minutes ago. I haven't had a chance to upload it. So Mario, you, you are paying for that class. You paid for the access to that class. You will have access to it pretty soon. Um, I, I'll get it uploaded today after the next live stream. I'm fixing the kickoff here and start live streaming on the private Patreon channel. Uh, and you'll have access to that, Mario. Um, and then here, when I get this other class uploaded that you would, you would already pay for, you're going to have access to it to the first part. And it will butt right up to this one. Uh, so I'm going to keep putting them back up there. I'll have it uploaded later. Keith, is my t-shirt in the mail? I don't know yet, Chris. Uh, I, my wife got um, my t-shirt and Bryn's t-shirt in anticipation of the... Oh, guess on I will. It's, it's patreon.com backslash Keith Perkins, one word. Uh, but I'll put it up there here in a little bit. And there's a link on my, um, there's a link on the front page of my YouTube channel. Uh, shirt is very nice. I, I like it. I think it's very nice. So I really enjoy it. it this is, um, so it's the same company that makes the shirts for, um, or the, the brand of shirt is Sport Tech. It's the same shirts that uh, Scott Brown used for his Diag.net founder package shirts. And those are really nice. Uh, they make it expensive, so it'll be cheaper to go through the dealer. Right, that's a challenge I'm dealing with today as I'm going, or not today, but throughout this last week since I've, I've gone out and been 100% self-employed, mobile diag, module programming, the mobilizer issues, is I have people tell me, oh, well, the dealer's only 100 bucks. Why are you 125 I'm like, well, because I drive to you and you don't have to pay a tow truck. And they're like, oh, oh, that's a good deal then. Yeah, that's, not, that's pretty convenient. So when is the next TBT live stream? Bruce? I believe Monday is the next TBT live stream. So tomorrow. What's more expensive, SK? What? Hey, Mario. I didn't even see you. Peekaboo. I didn't see you coming earlier either. Thanks again. So, anyways, I got to get off here. I got to go over to Patreon. Uh, and then we're going to do that. Hey, Bill. Everyone's coming in now? Everyone wants to come in now? I see how it is. What's more expensive? Right now, the dealer. That's right. But... I, I'm with you, SKO. My local GM dealer is now doing module flashes for like $90, like $89.95. So that's hard to beat. Um, anyways, I got to get off here. For real, guys, quit. Stop. Keep, keep interrupting me, and you keep getting me to stick around, and I want to talk to all you, but I really got to go. So, <laughs> all right, guys, shut it off. Uh, I'll shut off the stream. See you later, Chad.
Um, any guys that are diagnostician level or higher on the Patreon thing, you'll be able to see it. Um, so before you guys leave, remember, don't, you know, I'm sorry, but the $1 Patreon doesn't get you into all the videos. But um, anyways, see you guys later. See you, Bert. See you, Sandra. We'll talk to everyone. Hey, Miguel. I didn't even see you in there. All right, Keith. Fine. What? One question. He says one question, and he's going to make me wait. He's going to wait like three minutes to do it, and then he's going to send the question. It's going to be something dumb, but i got to do it because I owe Keith. And I'm not singing to you anymore. Just one <laughs> question. All right, Keith, text me. Fine. That's that, and I'll talk about it the next one. I really gotta stop this. <laughs> All right.